<laughs> so thank you so much, uh, uh, Bert and Bram, for bringing us together also for uh, the researchers, the patient organizations, and, and uh, uh, patients and parents together. Um, even though for uh, for researchers uh, like us, this is really like a great opportunity to learn about uh, each other's work and uh, update each other and also catch up actually, you know, it's kind of like a reunion. Um, and the name of the conference here is the Road of Therapy, to Therapy, and I think I really like that name because uh, it's very appropriate. Um, I also really like the transportation system in the Netherlands. I lived here for 10 years actually, so um, I moved to the US now, but um, I always miss the, 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 the neatness of, uh, of Dutch uh, transport system. So you have the excellent uh, railway system, um, you have the, the highway which is great, right? And of course the bike path that uh, the Dutch people should be very proud and everybody else in the world should be very jealous of, by the way. So um, if treatments are like mode of transportation and we want to develop this, um, I think we need to first understand the landscape, we need to dig the ground. And I think Maddie gave a, an excellent um, uh, outline about that because that takes actually uh, many, many, many years of research as you can appreciate. Um, also the work of many people in, in the room um, who uh, raised their hands along the, along the explanation. So, um, so we've been quite good at understanding the landscape. So the next uh, stage will be to build the infrastructure, right? You cannot uh, build the road, the rail, and the bike path. And um, if I think about the infrastructure of therapeutic developments, and this is by no means an exhaustive uh, uh, list, uh, but um, I divided it into two. So one is the animal models, and the other one is the cultured cells. Uh, you've seen the uh, DY2J, uh, DY3K, DYW that we all use in the, in the world. Um, so they range from no lama 2, absent of lama 2, to uh, a little bit of lama 2, so complete to partial loss of lama 2. And the benefit of uh, using uh, mouse models, of course, are uh, they have organs. <laughs> so you can look at the muscles, the brains, the nerves, the lungs. Uh, also, it has circulation, right? So if you introduce therapy, it goes everywhere. And of course, you look at immune. You can also look at immunity uh, or immune response if you want to um, do some kind of therapy. Uh, to you want to introduce something to your body. Uh, the limitations, of course, is that uh, working with animal models are quite expensive. So I put three dollar signs over there. Maybe I should put four dollar signs. Um, <coughs> Also, uh, the mouse uh, have mouse DNA, right? And it's not human DNA. So that's why the other system would uh, matter here. So we have cultured cells as well. Um, so this cartoon basically here represents a patient and we get cells from, uh, from patients that we can then grow in our, our, uh, our lab. So you have one cell here, we can actually expand them, put them in incubator. Um, which mimic your body temperature and grow them uh, further. Um, so, as we know, this disease is a rare disease, right? So we don't have, we don't uh, see uh, a lot of patients. So we don't have uh, many patients, but this um, uh, system is, of course, very valuable. Uh, you can do a lot of first tests before, say, going to the mice. And in terms of feasibility, um, working with cells are not totally cheap, but then it's a bit cheaper than working with mice. But a compromise with life. <laughs> so the limitations will be that it's, uh, we don't have organs, you cannot look at the brain's muscles and say a liver together. So you look at it uh, individually and there's no circulation and you cannot look at uh, immune response. All right, so we compromise, right? In life we compromise. Um, so I'm showing you here the DY2J mouse model for MDC1A because that's the the, um, uh, the system that I've uh, been working on in the past uh, few years, actually. Um, and you've seen uh, the video that Maddie showed, but here uh, I'm comparing a healthy mouse, so just normal random mouse, to a DY2J mouse. And you can totally see, you can pick it up uh, if you just you know randomly uh, uh, see this. You see the hindling paralysis and contracture, and if you actually open up the mouse and look at the muscle, then you see something that looks like that. So this is healthy muscles where the muscle cells are quite homogeneous in size and they are properly aligned together and give us some function. 
But in the dual DJ muscle, you have so many things going on, and many touch, uh, touch on uh, fibrosis, uh, immune cells, um, adipose tissues, etc. Uh, so this mouse model has been established for uh, since really long time ago, um, and it has defective LAMA2. So how do we make LAMA2? Um, what is the recipe to make LAMA2? I'm trying to like have it a little bit of a, a really simplified way here. Um, so you have your DNA, right? Your genotype. Um, so you have 65 blobs over there. You can see um, those blobs are called axons. And then the loopy structures there are called introns. Your cells will then sort of like remove the introns to read this message. So you have a template or messenger that you can read. So you have uh, chapter one to chapter 65, let's say. And that will make the protein, which is the lama 2. And the lama 2 um, is part of our muscle. That's basically how, how it is. Um, the DY2J has one misspelling or one mutation in the DNA. Um, instead of a G over there, the blue uh, side here in the, in the uh, healthy situation, you have an A. So it's just one letter change. But this letter is quite important because what happens if you have A, you have a wrong template. You're missing this chapter, chapter 2. Chapter 3 is usually good, I guess. Uh, in this case, this is good. Um, and then you get lama 2 that is missing this head, so the head is chopped up, right? And this leads to non-functional muscle. Okay, so what do we want to do? Of course, we want to correct this misspelling if possible and improve the muscle condition. So we want to try to improve muscle that looks like that to something that looks closely resemble healthy muscle. Go back to the Dutch transportation system. What do we do now? We have the infrastructure. We have a problem. Uh, we not we need to adopt the technology. So say you build a train, or you take a train from France, for example. So uh, you borrow the technology, or develop, or apply the technology that you need. So um, here I'm borrowing this technology um, that is called the CRISPR-Cas9. Um, it's a very complicated thing to, to explain, but basically uh, what it does, it acts like a genomic scissor, it's like a, uh, a scissor uh, for your DNA. It cuts things, okay? Um, so what can we use it for? We can use it to cut out the misspelled DNA in the DY2J mouse. So we have one scissor over there that cuts before the A, we call it the rep scissor. And then we try to find a G within this book chapter and then develop a scissor, another scissor, so I'm getting that, we call it the blue scissor, and you cut out with gene, and then the cells will then try to repair itself, so now you have a G right after exon 2, right? So that should be hypothetically lead to corrected messenger that will lead to normal lamb 2, and hypothetically lead to better muscle. Great, I see like people are nodding, so they're good, they're good. Uh, so how would you do that exactly? How, how do we do that? Um, so we take the mouse, uh, we take the black baby, uh, uh, baby uh, UI2J mice. So here you have untreated, you have treated um, cohorts. So this is a baby mice. We use um, um, AV9, which is kind of like a harmless virus. We package these scissors, the red scissors and the blue scissors over here, and then inject it into the newborn uh, pups, so newborn uh, UI2J mice and we let them grow um, to adulthood. Uh, as a control, you have the empty virus here. So it's not totally empty, but it doesn't have the scissors that will cut the, the DNA. So we have this uh, in parallel, side by side, so that we can compare them um, eventually. So what you see there, um, these black box here, shows no lama 2 in the muscle. And that is an adult DY2J mouse. It needs a little bit of encouragement to move in the cage. Um, you see the hind limb paralysis and then the kyphosis, and it's trying to, to, to stand up, basically, but it's unable to. And then the treated mouse over here, you start to see lama 2 being expressed in the basement membrane of the muscle, as many uh, eluded. And this is how the mouse looks like. So it moves very. Uh, uh, mobile, it moves very well, it can stand up, 
and you look at all different parameters, they are all improved, basically. Most of them are improved, okay? So this was very exciting. Um, we were excited. Uh, we got uh, a lot of reactions also from patient community. Um, uh, this is a column uh, written by uh, Mark Baer, who was supposed to be here, but uh, he cannot make it for a really uh, uh, um, happy news, actually. He has another baby. Uh, Mark Baer is a... Um, uh, father of uh, Bella Bear over there. Um, Bella uh, pretty much is the first MBC1A patient that I've seen. And we bonded exactly, uh, like immediately, because we both like pink and we both like snow. <laughs> so we have a lot to talk about. Um, so Mark here uh, wrote out a um, pretty nice column. Um, but he also says that uh, sometimes scientific papers are usually a little challenging for most non-scientists to read. So this is also, again, it's really good for us to actually meet and you can like bug us, what do you mean by this, right? Um, so this uh, work was done when I was working in Toronto uh, in the lab of Dr. Ronnie Cohn. This is this uh, smiling pediatrician here. He's a, he's a really great guy. If you, um, maybe next year you'll, you'll meet him uh, if we have this uh, meeting again. All right, so next step would be um, how can we uh, take uh, from something that works very well in a mouse model to something that would have clinical application in the human being. So this by no means that we are going to inject tomorrow. This is, of course, a really long process, but uh, I hope that you can appreciate that um, we are trying to think about uh, everything that we do in the lab. We are trying to think about you guys, right? How can we correct misspelled DNA that are found in patients? Um, so this is probably my third uh, family meeting, I think. Oh, no, my second, actually. Um, the first one was in DC, this one, so QCMD uh, Scientific and fam Family Meeting. Uh, this was facilitated by uh, Gustavo Zivchevalski. Maybe you can uh, wave, if you, there you go. Uh, so he's uh, the... Uh, director of the QCMD, the research director of the QCMD. So um, he throws, did I butcher your title? It's pretty much like that. He's the very important person here at the QCMD. Yeah. Um, so he threw um, um, a great meeting in DC two years ago uh, where I met uh, many patients and connected and I was able to obtain uh, skin cells from MBC1A patients uh, with the help of QCMD and pretty much global scientific community. Um, it's really like from all over the world. Um, Netherlands, Italy, Hungary, uh, many uh, sites in the US and Canada. So, um, the next stage, we are trying this in the patient cells. And I'm gonna show you how we learn from sort of like a little bit of miscalculations uh, from, from, from this approach. So, to correct the spelling error in mice, we need to have two scissors, the red and the blue scissors, remember? But every patient is different, so almost each patient has unique spelling error or mutation. So there's a genotype-phenotype correlation, remember uh, the, the uh, lecture before? So what you see here, this is um, human lama 2 gene, and each of the dots here represent the location of the spelling error. So the, the, the A was spread out throughout the gene. And what does it mean? It means that to, if we have to correct this, we need to develop different scissors for each of the patient. Maybe you get red and blue, maybe somebody else uh, need green and purple, and somebody else needs something else, right? So this will lead to something that is very costly. So each patient will require different strategies and as well, each uh, strategy might lead to different risks. So this is expensive, this is exhaustive, and um, if we actually bring it to the uh, uh, regulatory body, maybe they won't like it. So it's very challenging to, to move this forward. And that's what I meant by a little bit of miscalculation. But we learn from that, and what, what do we do from, uh, from here? We go back to science, we try to go back to what um, what our predecessors or our colleagues uh, have learned over the year and try to refine the technology. Saying it another way, we shift the question now. Instead of developing a mutation for each of the patient individually, can we actually develop something that will be applicable for everybody? 
So we go back to our famous uh, uh, friend, Laminin Alpha 1. Um, I call it a little sister of Lama 2, or a little twisted sister of Lama 2, um, because they are twisting, right? Um, so Lama 1 is very similar to Lama 2. Um, however, it is only expressed in the muscle during embryonic stage, and then somehow it gets turned off. So you don't have it, I don't have it, the mice don't have it. But we know also from all the uh, works that Mehdi has um, explained that it should be able to compensate for the lack of lemma too. So how do we refine the technology? Um, so this is an easy way to think about it. If the original CRISPR is to cut and edit, so like a scissors, the second version here that I'm about to show you uh, works just like a magnifying glass. So it enhances something. Uh, sometimes people also um, have a synonym like a turn on the light in the room, um, but it doesn't cut, okay, it's not a scissor. But everything else, we still use this, the, the, the approach that we learned from the original approach. We use again the newborn DY2J uh, pups, but now into the virus, instead of adding scissors, we added magnifying glass. And we let the uh, mice grow to adulthood again. And this is um, um, the result. So you have untreated muscle here that doesn't have lama 2, doesn't have lama 1. Um, there is a, a significant fibrosis. And in a treated mouse here, you don't have lama 2, but now you have lama 1. And muscle gets better. This is an untreated uh, mouse. It uh, has difficulty in moving in the cage. But here's also um, how you see the treated mouse. It's able to stand up and um, has a, a good outcome uh, in, the, in the function. <laughs> All right, um, I just want to throw in here that this type of effort took really a village. It took a lot of people to come together. And, and that's on top of everybody else who has been working on this for about you know, more than 20 years. You see the smiling pediatrician again, that's my uh, previous boss. Uh, this one, and uh, Dr. Ronnie Kwan. Um, so this brilliant uh, gentleman here is like my partner in crime in the lab. He's now studying to be real human doctor instead of being a mouse doctor. So uh, we're looking forward to, to see how, how he um, blossoms. Uh, and of course, Maddie and Kinga help us a lot. Uh, the very wise uh, uh, Peter Yurchenko as well, and many more uh, uh, scientists from, from, from everywhere. So I moved from Toronto to uh, Pittsburgh to sort of like build my new uh, village. And this is something that is very common if you're not familiar with, um, with an academic system. You sort of like train in one place and then you move and then you expand your research. So it's not a bad thing actually. Um, so what are we going to do now in Pittsburgh? So uh, we come back to the really difficult questions, right? Can we turn on Lama 1 from mouse? from something that works in a mouse to something that works in human cells. And I put the cells here underlined because again, this is cells. The cells that I grew in the laboratory in contained uh, temperature. Um, remember that I got uh, uh, cells from a lot of patients from my interactions with uh, QCMD and everybody else uh, working on this disease. So now I have them in, in, the, in the lab and I'm trying to add the magnifying glass to the cells, not using virus, but kind of like a zapping uh, method. So you zap the, the cell so that it has like little holes and then you put the magnifying glass. It works a little bit more complicated than that, but pretty much that's what, uh, what this machine does. Um, and this is another way of looking at LAMA1. Um, this is called Western blot. We look at the protein. And here you see the cells that are untreated it doesn't have lama 1, and the cells that receive the magnifying glass or treated starts to have lama 1 again. So can we turn on lama 1 in human cells? Yes, we can. I have a new friend now. I moved to the US. Um, Obama is my friend, not the new guy. Um, what about others? Um, again, I have this, uh, we have this uh, help from the community. Uh, to sort of, sort of like develop what's so called a mini biobank from um, uh, with cells from many different patients, and uh, this is a little bit more complicated Western blot, 
but basically what you should see or what you should appreciate is if we start with nothing, so untreated has no lama 1. Now uh, all patients here, patients A to I, um, have expression of lama 1. So that's a good thing. But uh, one thing that we also see here is that everybody responds differently. So patients A and patients H, for example, has to, uh, have a little bit of lama 1 and uh, patient I over here are blasting with lama 1. The patient the cells from patient's eye. Um, so lama 1 upregulations in cells are pos uh, possible or feasible but with uh, varying degrees. All right, so this is what I'm going to leave you actually. Um, the more we know, the more we have questions. This is not the end, so there are a lot of uh, considerations still, and I sort of like outline it again back to the two uh, infrastructures. Um, let's start with culture cells. So we'll continue growing the cells, and we will try to figure out why lama one upregulation is different among uh, patient cells. Maybe it's the genetic modifiers. We talked a lot about genetic modifiers earlier. And then what would be considered enough? Would it be enough if we have um, uh, this level, or do we need to have that level? And if we do need to have that level, how do we increase this? How do we increase patient A so that, it, so that uh, the cells can produce more lama 1? And uh, for these um, diverse patient cells will be really valuable. Um, so CureCMD has a registry. If uh, uh, maybe later during the um, uh, round table, you can talk with uh, Mr. Uh, Bossman there, uh, Gustavo. <laughs> He's very nice. <laughs> I'm just joking all the time. Um, to sort of like uh, register uh, the mutations for, for, for this kind of approach. And then, uh, of course, we want to go back to animal models to answer other questions. Like, do we have to use viruses? Or is there any non-virus approach that we can use? Uh, what about immune reactions to the either the scissor or magnifying glass? Because either it's scissor or magnifying glass, there are still uh, foreign bodies that you want to put to somebody else's body, right? So um, there might be um, rejection to that. And then what is the therapeutic window of intervention? Can we treat even older mice? Uh, can it improve survival? And how long will lama one upregulation last? Will it get shut off again at some point? So all these questions will still need to be answered. So yeah, stay tuned. Um, oh yeah, one more actually. So lessons learned. Let me just put all this thing. Um, it really takes a long time to understand the biology of the disease. And uh, along the way, we are trying it. Um, for trials and errors, and we learn from this uh, along the way. And sometimes, we just have to wait for the right tools, right? Uh, and finally, uh, we need to support each other. Uh, we like each other. It's, to begin with, it's not good to hate each other, but we especially need to support each other if we work with uh, rare disease. So the scientists, the patients, and parents are in this together. All right, so thank you, and I am visiting you now, so if you want to uh, come and visit me, you're very welcome to come to Pittsburgh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.